Good morning, Hamilton Church. Welcome to our online Sunday service. My name is Brooke, and I'm a campus student here at McMaster University. We're so excited to hear Danny Brisbois' final sermon on his sermon series on Exodus. Today, his sermon is titled, God's Special People. But first, I would love to share about the amazing Women's Day service that us sisters got to have last Sunday. Clarissa Herka did an amazing lesson on Esther titled, This Is My Time. What I was most impacted by by this lesson was that Esther was an imperfect person. She had imperfect life circumstances, but she still decided that that was her time to stand up for her people, her God, and have an impact on the world. Similarly, I am an imperfect person. I have imperfect life circumstances, but this is still my time to make an impact on McMaster campus because God is my father. I would really love to lift up Jillian and all of the other sisters who poured so much time and energy into this Women's Day service to make this happen. I would also love to lift up the brothers who met together without us sisters. I know that must have been hard to do. Uh, some of you guys even got up as early as 9 a.m. to commune with one another. I hope that you guys had an amazing time doing that. Now I would love to hand it off to Hilary Schantz as she shares about what she got out of last Sunday. Thank you guys. Love you all. I hope you guys have an amazing Sunday service. Hi, my name is Hilary Schantz and I'll share briefly about a couple of things that impacted me about the recent Women's Day. It was about Esther, who is a heroine in the Old Testament. And a couple of points that just stuck with me is that one, God has a unique assignment for each one of us. And that just makes me so comfortable to know that I don't need to compare myself to anyone else. God made me unique and he's given me a unique background. He's given me a new unique history and he also has a unique assignment. So the second point that really struck me because it's not my nature is that God, she waited for the invitation to speak. And what I understand by that is that she had become a woman who was comfortable in God's leading and in God making things happen at his own time. And for many of us, we can often feel that nothing's going on, that we're not having an impact, that perhaps we're not enough. But we see that God was at work and that, that's helped me to really see when, when the time comes that I need to say or do something or be something, I can just be comfortable with following God's lead. Thank you so much. Good morning, good morning everyone. Uh, what a great week, what a great day. So grateful for the spring. Uh, so, so proud of the woman. Uh, I know you worked very hard uh, the last few weeks for your special Woman's Day last uh, Sunday. Thank you, uh, Brooke, 
and also uh, uh, Hillary for uh, your sharing. And uh, so, so, so uh, encouraged a couple weeks ago by the uh, new birth, the spiritual birth of uh, Danielle. Uh, it was absolutely amazing and uh, we're all excited and praying for uh, you. And uh, of course, two weeks ago, it was the uh, celebration of life of Carl Ribetai. And of course, it, it, it's a bittersweet, it's, it's sad, we'll miss him, but so proud of him, the way he uh, carried himself uh, by faith to the, his last breath and the uh, impact he had on so many people. And uh, he is now in a better place. He is in heaven. And this is what we all about. This is why we're gathering today. And if you're visiting, uh, welcome. Hope you're gonna enjoy uh, today's message, and uh, we saw just a couple weeks ago uh, a lesson entitled uh, Looking Ahead. We looked at um, the uh, great uh, spirit and faith of uh, Moses, who was able to look ahead. And I just want to refresh uh, our memory by reading in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 25-26. Talking about Moses, we read, He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God, rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasure, pleasures of sin. He regarded this grace for the sake of Christ as of a greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. That's amazing. Like he had it all. He grew up in Pharaoh's household with his daughter, but at one point in his life decided to, to leave all this behind and, and going back uh, with his people, Jewish people, and he went through many years of um, humbling and, and he never gave up uh, his faith. Why? Because he was looking ahead to his reward. And actually, after they left Egypt, we saw this and we will see this uh, more closely today. Uh, he, he never had a chance uh, to go in the promised land. Uh, actually, for 40 years with the, the rest of his people, they, 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 they live in the wilderness in the desert, they wander in the desert for 40 years, yet he never gave up his faith all the way to the end when he was uh, almost there in the, in the promised land. And, and for us, it's, it's a great image uh, reminding us that um, the, the wilderness that they've been through is a foreshadow of us as Christian. After we get baptized, as we saw with Daniel, uh, life will, won't become... Uh, like uh, easy suddenly with no obstacle, just like she was in heaven already. No, like uh, just as them, they, we, we're going to go through many challenges as Christian in our uh, promised land, actually. It's at the end of everything, at the end of our life in heaven. Now, uh, before we uh, carry on with our lesson today, uh, let's watch at that video from Bible Project covering the second part of the book of uh, Exodus. Uh, you know, you'll show how much is rich and how much this book can teach us so many uh, valuable lesson, lesson for us today as Christian. The book of Exodus. In the first video, we explored chapters 1 through 18, which tell the foundational story of how God rescued the enslaved Israelites by confronting and defeating Pharaoh, while offering a way of escape through the blood of the Passover lamb. God then delivered his people by bringing them through the waters of the sea and then into the wilderness, where, surprisingly, they grumbled and complained. Now, the second half of the book of Exodus opens as Moses leads Israel to the foot of Mount Sinai, where God invites the nation of Israel to enter into a covenant relationship. And here we reach another key moment in the biblical storyline, because this is picking up and developing God's promise to Abraham. So remember, from the book of Genesis, God promised that through Abraham's family, somehow he would restore his blessing to all of the nations. And here we find out more. God says that if Israel obeys the terms of the covenant. They will be so shaped by God's laws and teaching and justice that they will become a kingdom of priests, which means that they will become God's representatives and show all of the other nations what God is truly like. Now, the people of Israel eagerly accept the offer, and so God's presence appears right on the top of Mount Sinai in the form of cloud and lightning and thunder. And Moses goes up as their representative, and God opens with the basic terms of the covenant, the famous Ten Commandments. These are like the basic terms of the agreement, how the Israelites and God are going to relate 
to each other. And then after this come another collection of commands which fill out the first ten in more detail. There are laws about Israel's worship, about social justice, how they are to live together, all shaping Israel into a nation of justice and generosity that's different from the other nations. So Moses writes down all of these laws and he brings them down to the people who again eagerly agree to enter into this covenant with God. And once they do so, God takes the relationship forward another step. He tells Moses that he wants his holy and divine and good presence to come and dwell right in the midst of Israel, which develops another aspect of God's covenant promises. So remember, after humanity's rebellion in the garden, it was access to God's presence that was lost. But now it's through the family of Abraham that God's presence is becoming once again accessible through this covenant relationship, and first with Israel, and then somehow one day to all nations. So what follows are seven chapters of detailed architectural blueprints about this sacred tent called the tabernacle. There's an outer courtyard with an altar, and then in the center there's a tent that has an outer room and then an inner room. And then inside the inner room, which is called the most holy space, is a golden box called the Ark of the Covenant. And there's angelic creatures over the top of it. It's the hot spot of God's presence. Now there's lots of detail in these chapters, and it's important to know that every piece has some kind of symbolic value. All of the flowers, the angels, the gold and the jewels, it all echoes back to the Garden of Eden, the place where God and humans live together in intimacy. And so the tabernacle is like a portable Eden, so to speak. It's the place where God and Israel can live together in peace, at least in theory, because right here something goes really, really wrong. Israel breaks the covenant. As Moses is up on the mountain receiving the blueprints for the tabernacle, down below at the camp, the Israelites, they're losing patience. And so they ask Moses' brother Aaron to make for them a golden calf idol so they can worship it as the God who saved them out of slavery in Egypt. Now God's presence, it's right there on top of the mountain. They can see it. But here they are below, breaking the first two commands of the covenant they just agreed to. No other gods and no idols. Now what follows is really important. God knows what's happening down below. And so he first invites Moses into his own anger and pain. And he tells Moses what he wants to do, just to wipe Israel out. But Moses intercedes by appealing to God's character. He says, first of all, destroying Israel would be going back on your covenant promises to Abraham. And then Moses appeals to God's reputation among the nations. What would they think if they see you destroying your own people? And so God accepts Moses' intercession and he relents. And while he does bring his judgment on those who instigated the idolatry, he forgives the nation as a whole and promises to renew his covenant. And it's right here at this point in the story that God, for the first time, describes his own character to Moses. He says, the Lord is merciful. He's gracious. He's slow to anger, abounding in covenant faithfulness. He forgives sin, but he will not leave the wicked unpunished. So we have this tension. God is full of mercy, but also he must deal with evil if he claims to be good. And above all, God is faithful to his promises, even though it means, he knows, he's committing himself to a people who are utterly faithless. So the the title of my lesson today is God's Special People. God's Special People. Uh, And we're going to look with the the first scripture in uh, Exodus chapter 19, uh, how God had a vision already way before Jesus about the new identity for his people and the very special purpose uh, in this world. We read in the book of Exodus chapter 19, verse 5 to 6, Out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. You will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So we see despite all the mess, despite the the, the sin that they fell into right away at Mount Sinai while Moses was getting the the, the book of the laws, uh, it just showed us how much uh, God cared for his people. He could uh, wipe us at, at this point. He should say, that's over. No, what he did... He cast a vision. He cast a vision for Moses, 
for the future. And he said, uh, out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. I'll get back to, to this in a sec, but this is very important uh, expression here. And, and he's already uh, casting that vision. You'll be a kingdom, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. We see that being accomplished in the New Testament after uh, Jesus' uh, passage here on earth, especially after his death on the cross and his resurrection. We read from the Apostle Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, and we'll see that God wants the same thing for us today. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who call you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So we see here uh, the prophecy that we read just before in Exodus chapter 19 came through true uh, after Jesus. And that's what Peter, the apostle, is reminding the, the, the Christian. And if we are a Christian today, uh, this is not something to hope for. This is accomplished. That's what he said. You are. This is our new identity. We are chosen people. That came true because of Jesus. That reminds me of uh, one parable, short parable in Matthew uh, 13, uh, verse 44, when uh, Jesus was talking about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. We read, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, went out and sold all he had and bought that field. You know, we, we use that parable often to, to, to tell people if they become Christian and if they put their faith in God, they will be part of a kingdom. And uh, it's worth uh, all the treasure, everything you can, may have and possess in your life in order to be part and, and, and possess that kingdom. Rightly so. But I think when Jesus is teaching that parable, he's talking about God himself. He's talking about the Father, the, the, the Creator, uh, that, you know, this is the way he looks at the church. This is the way he looks at Jesus' disciple. This is a hidden treasure in the field. And this is a, a very precious uh, and special possession for God. So we see uh, that God's dream came true with us because of Jesus. And this is uh, our new identity. We are chosen. We are God's special possession. And, and the relationship from the beginning God wanted to establish between His people and Himself, it's a father-son relationship, uh, a father-daughter relationship. This is how He sees us. He doesn't see us as, you know, something far from Himself, but, but from His, like His own children. Not only that, from the beginning, and especially uh, in Christ in the New Testament, He sees us because of our faith in Jesus, holy, blameless, without any defect. He sees us as perfect. Why does he see us as perfect? Because Jesus was willing to pay the price. And we see the tension. We, we, we saw at the end of the, the video that on one hand, God is merciful, yet he cannot leave sin unpunished. Uh, that tension, God's answer was sending his son, Jesus, as the uh, perfect lamb sacrifice for our sin in order for us to, to become completely blameless, holy in God's sight. Not only this, but He's going to make us the temple of God. God's Spirit uh, will now live inside of us. So when you read the book of Exodus, after giving the laws, uh, He's uh, giving instruction to Moses to, to build a tabernacle uh, where it's an image of God's presence with the Ark of the Covenant and all that, that was a foreshadow of us today. Us today being God's temple, literally, and God wanted to live inside of us. I know this is overwhelming. This is mind-boggling, but this is how God sees us, and that's why we are God's special possession. Not only we are God's temple, but we are a royal priesthood. We, we are priests of a royal rank. And when you think about and when you read about the role in the priest in the Old Testament, it was really, really, really important. And that's how he sees each one of us. We are priests, in other words, 
we intercede uh, for the world. We, we are in between God and, and, and the rest of the world. That's why uh, in other passages it talks about that as Christians, we are God's ambassador. We are His children. We are God's special possession. And we are this royal priesthood call for a clear and noble purpose. What is that purpose? Declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. We are there to declare the praises of God, of the Creator. That's what is our purpose of life, which is super uh, noble. Not easy, I, I will give it to you, but what an amazing a purpose we have uh, in God. G the, the Bible, the New Testament say, says that we are the same family than Jesus. Jesus is not ashamed to be called uh, our brother. He called us, uh, not as children only, but he called us to become fishers of men. He said, I will make you fishers of men. So it, it's for that purpose to, to go uh, and declare the praises of him who call us from darkness to uh, the light. And, and he said, actually, you don't just call people out, out of darkness. You are the light of the world. You are an example. This is how uh, Jesus was seeing us as God's special uh, people possession. Now, uh, as I said, the wilderness is a foreshadow of Christian life. So today we're going to look at uh, two important lessons. There's, there's many more, uh, but there's two important lessons we, we, we learn in the, the wilderness. The first lesson is uh, uh, the God's uh, people in Exodus, they were fed by manna in the wilderness. But we're going to look at uh, these passages that God wanted to teach his people something uh, way more important and deeper than the bread itself. He wanted to teach his people how to feed their soul with God's word, with his own word. As we uh, saw the last few weeks, right after they crossed the Red Sea, in a matter of days and weeks after, people complained. And uh, despite the, they were safe from slavery in Egypt and the Egyptians were running after them, ready to, to kill them, uh, they, they were saved. Uh, what happened right after? Well, they're hungry, they're thirsty, and they complained to Moses, complained to uh, God. What was God's answer to people's sin? Lack of gratitude and lack of faith and lack of anything. What was God's response to his people? Love. Great love, patient love, compassion, uh, and, and that's what blow me away about God. Let's read in Exodus chapter 16, verse 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instruction. So he, he didn't just uh, barely... Uh, provide something to survive. He said, I will rain down bread on you. And he gave a very uh, specific e e expression here. He said, you must go, uh, instruction, you must go out each day. Uh, getting out to get the, the manna was a, a daily reminder uh, of God's power and, and uh, the fact that we need to rely on God on a daily basis. And another instruction he's giving his people, make sure they gather enough just for that day. And it's this idea that was been carried on in the New Testament that we need to have a balanced life. This is, uh, you know, we need to take one day at a time and, and, and trusting that God will provide for, for, for uh, each day. We don't need to worry about tomorrow. We don't need to worry about next month, next year. This is what the, the world is trying to to convince and bombard us all the time. Anxiety, being stressed about the future. God, he said, no, 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 I'm with you. You are my children. You don't need to, to, to worry. Uh, just worry about uh, today and it will be good enough. So we keep reading in uh, Exodus chapter 16, verse 13 to 15. That evening, quail came and covered the camp 
And in the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread of the Lord has given you to eat. You have to picture this. Can, can you imagine like hundreds of thousands, millions of people in the desert had nothing to eat, no store, nothing. And, and, and then God every night will have this, uh, you know, layer of dew uh, appearing uh, miraculously right there on the ground beside where they, they were. And it, they had this every day for 40 years. And they had no clue what it was. It was new. And they said, this is the bread of the Lord that is given you to eat. I remember when I first met the church, started to, 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 to come to church, I was challenged to, to study, read the Bible. I was excited because I, I never had a chance to really do this before. And doing it as an adult was uh, exciting. And I made the decision to, to believe in, in God and Jesus and being baptized. And after this, I, I had to learn uh, as spiritual man, I need to feed myself every day, daily on spiritual food and the word of God. For me, it was kind of the, the man, I like the, the Bible. Like I didn't know what was the, 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 the Bible really. It was kind of strange. It was mysterious. It was a little bit like the, the manna, yet I discover what it is. This is what nourishing my soul every day. So 40 years uh, after Exodus, uh, we read in the fifth book of the Bible, Deuteronomy uh, chapter 8. It's a wonderful chapter. You want to go read the entire chapter on your own later. But let's read in verse 2 and 3. Uh, Moses is reflecting as they are just about to enter the promised land. Yet uh, Moses is at the end of his life and he's uh, giving very, very important instruction and going over what happened these last 40 years. Verse 3, remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. So rich chapter, as I said, we, we see here in that passage that uh, Moses, he wants uh, the people after him to remember how God led them. And I think that that's, that's, that's something so important to be remember how much, not just God had led us, but continue to lead us every day of our life, especially when we feel God is not there. God is there, trust me, leading you and uh, allowing us to be going through challenges and tests. Why? To see what's in our heart. God wants a real relationship. doesn't want a superficial relationship. He wants a deep, meaningful relationship. And that can only happen with the heart. Uh, we demand this in our relationship between man and woman. Uh, and even the relationship with our children, God wants and expects the same thing from us. He doesn't want religion, superficiality, us following a bunch of rules or a or, or, or weird tradition. He wants our heart. In order to, 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 to see where our heart is at, He, he had to, to, to allow us to go through time of testing. So He, he, he leads us, He, he, he makes sure our, our heart are being exposed. And he's teaching us a very, very valuable lesson, as we just read, that the man does not live on bread alone, but in every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. That reminds me, a great theologian, Charles uh, Swindle, uh, said this about this uh, episode of uh, the book of uh, Exodus. In the wilderness, God's covenant people struggled with a choice between feeding their bellies and nourishing their souls. God provided manna, a bread-like food that fell to the ground during the night to sustain the wandering Israelites and to teach them how to value His word more than physical fulfillment. 
I, I cannot agree more than, than this, you know? That happened not by accident, but with a design, with a purpose, and God wanted us to value His Word more than food, than solid food, and more than anything else. The context of uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8, if you read the whole chapter, uh, you, you'll see how God cares for His people, and He has that father-son relationship. We read in verse 5, Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. So, you know, sometimes we, we have an impression that God in the Old Testament is harsh, is, is difficult, is not loving. It's not true. He, he, he is madly in love with his people. And he has a, a relationship like father-son or father-daughter relationship. And because of this, he, he won't hold back and discipline his, his, his children to show how much he loved them and he cared for them long term. Uh, the context of, also of that chapter 8, Moses is telling them, we're about to enter the, the, the promised land. We will enter that promised land. That promised land is amazing. It's filled with honey and great thing. You will be blessed. You will have success. You'll become rich. You will, you will increase your wealth. You will grow in power. And he said something so important. When it will happen, don't forget where you come from. Therefore, praise God. Don't forget where you come from. Therefore, stay humble. And he warned his people that uh, they become prideful. Their heart will become prideful to the point at, at at some point, they will think that all that power, all that wealth be kind of be, came because of their work, because of their intelligence, forgetting who they are, who God is, and, and where they're coming from. Um, that passage we just read, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Jesus himself, right after his baptism, when he was in the desert, tempted for 40 days with Satan himself tempting him. When he, when he challenged Jesus to transform stone into bread, Jesus used that very scripture to answer and retaliate against uh, Satan. Man does not live on bread alone. Leave me alone. Get out of here. Jesus, the Son, in, in relationship, perfect relationship with his father, showed us what was uh, Moses was talking about in these books we are reading and the importance of being devoted to God's word on a daily basis. What about this passage in the New Testament? First Peter chapter 1, we start reading in verse 23. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. Peter is reminding them, if, if we are children of God, if we were born again, we, 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 we became these uh, special people of God through um, baptism uh, and faith, uh, it's because of in God's word, enduring God's word. And, and he keep on in verse 24, for all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. He's reminding people how futile we are as, Christ, as uh, human beings. We, we are just like grass. Everything will disappear. Everything in this world you think that is so amazing, so uh, beautiful and, and exciting will be gone one day. But the word of the Lord will endure forever. Let's keep reading in chapter 2 to see where he wants the apostle to bring us. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tested that the Lord is Good. What a beautiful image. Did you ever observe a, a new baby, a, a newborn baby? Did you see how often they 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 craving for their, their mom's milk? 
did you observe the devotion they, they have when, when um, you know, meal time come for them? I can't wait. I, I can't help but to, to think about uh, Aaron and Rachel Taylor right now with finally their little Benjamin being back back home. Like, I can't wait to see them. But I can just picture and imagine that little Benjamin just just every couple of hours, like, give me food. I, I, I want my, my mom's milk. Peter is using that image to say that's how we should be. And he's not talking to young Christian or, 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 or Christian to be. He's talking to people who mature, who've been around a long time. He said, this is the attitude we need to have. We need to value God's word more than the actual food or anything else, actually. So first lesson I want to talk about this morning is fed by manna in the wilderness uh, it, it's a great lesson to learn how to feed our soul with God's Word. So secondly and finally, let's look at a second great lesson in the wilderness, uh, what I call a sign, uh, a great sign in the wilderness, and we'll learn about the importance of prayer. Exodus chapter 17, verse 10 to 13. We, uh, we see a story where uh, uh, Moses' assistant Joshua He's uh, called to fight an important, crucial battle in the valley. During that time, him will be on a mountain to, to pray. We read in verse 10, So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered, ordered, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Ur heard, held his hands up on the one side and on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. <laughs> what a, an inspiring story. This, this is a great fight needs to, to happen and Moses, he, he, he was not uh, partly a, a warrior and he was old, but he saw a very crucial uh, role he had as leader. It's to stand on the hill and pray, pray for the battle. And it teaches us uh, something very important. Spiritual battles are won by prayers. Spiritual battles are won by prayers. And the other valuable lesson we see here, uh, we see at some point he was so tired, he was not able to hold his, his hands in the air. What he did, he, he asked his two friends, uh, Aaron and Ur, to, 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 to hold his hand up as he was keep at praying. And he teaches us a, a, another very valuable lesson. And if you're a Christian, you understand this as well. Spiritual battles are won together. Spiritual battles are won together. Teamwork, coming together, it is so, so important, so crucial as a Christian. It reminds me uh, a great memory uh, a few years ago at uh, Camp Oma. Oh my gosh, I miss being together. I miss uh, having these memories uh, of retreat. And uh, for those who were there, you remember the tent of prayer for, from Friday all the way to Sunday morning having that tent in the back set up with all the prayer requests and everybody uh, taking a, a, a turn for an hour, uh, morning till afternoon, till night, for two days, 48 hours, praying and, and bringing these prayer to God. What a powerful thing. And we know that we saw great um, prayers, uh, great miracles being accomplished through these uh, prayers. Recently, I, I, I'm, I was so uh, encouraged by international day of prayers with the, the sister before their event. Not, not just here in Canada, but everywhere in the world, the sister prayed and prayed for these uh, events were happening everywhere in the world. And, and I know uh, it, it will accomplish great things, not because of us, but uh, because of uh, the power of God through uh, prayer that teaches us the spiritual battles are won by prayer and spiritual battles are won together. But I shared that insight uh, before, but I, I, I want to bring us back just one verse before uh, what we read to show you something very, very uh, interesting. 
Exodus chapter 17, verse 9. Moses said to Joshua, Choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. You know, like for generation, there is Christian who, 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 who sought the scripture and couldn't help it but seeing signs of Christianity, seeing signs of Jesus all over the place. Can you see the picture? Look at uh, Moses holding the hand in the air with the staff of God and, and the two men side by side helping him praying. What do you see? Well, for, for many Christians, they see something amazing. Christ, Jesus on the cross, hang to the, the wood and, and with these two men side by side of him, accomplishing the forgiveness of our sin for the rest of humanity. And for me, this is a sign. When I read this uh, scripture, I cannot help it but seeing a foreshadowing of the cross of Jesus. And it teaches us so many valuable lessons. We can't fight and be successful on our own power. We need God's power. And that power cr comes through prayer. And uh, we cannot do this alone. We need to do it together. And secondly, as we saw today, we need God's wisdom. We need His Word to get the direction, the wisdom we need to clearly uh, walk in uh, Jesus' path and accomplishing His uh, will. As we close, I will bring us back to where we begin today. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of Him who call you out of darkness into His wonderful light. Let's rejoice over not just these great prophecies, but the fulfillment of those prophecies in our life today. That's not what we will be. This is what we are today already. Loving you to God's glory. Welcome here in Canada for the uh, online virtual uh, celebration of new birth of Danielle. So, so exciting. Um, Your journey has been um, so inspirational, I know, to me. Um, really watching you grow has been uh, the greatest honor for me. So when I think of um, Danielle's story so far, her journey so far, I just really see how God's love changes people. Um, when Janice and I first started studying with Danielle, we prayed that, Jan uh, that Danielle would fall in love with God. Um, this was our prayer throughout, and um, I definitely see how God has answered that prayer. Uh, I've seen how much you responded to God's love, you know, and how much you are uh, being set free from everything that's in your heart and um, uh, I considered our journey the most special one because you are very special to me your parents are very special to me your mom is very special to me so I'm just so grateful I know Donna is watching um, in heaven with us rejoicing the, the word maybe that I wanted to share to you is about embrace embrace tightly and deeply the love of god in your heart embrace the new life that god is offering um, you're going to be a disciple and uh, you're going to be a daughter of god now seeing her is really already you know uh, a blessing and uh, you know you know we, you know, I just want to really lift up God, and it's not to us our glory, but you know, for for Him alone, and to God be the glory. And uh, you know, she's uh, she really are, you know, for me, I look up to her. She's smart, and 
Uh, we love her from the very moment that she, she was born. Um, your mom, my wife, uh, is, is really happy. Uh, all those times, really, uh, she, she prayed, we prayed for you. We prayed for you ever since and every single day. So, we love you. <laughs> love you, sis. Love you, my, my firstborn daughter. We love you so much. And I want to share this, the scripture, um, Psalms 37, verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? So, um, when I read it, I instantly, like, I instantly, like, felt peace in my, in my mind and also heart. And just, like, and just reassurance. Not only being reassured because that He is with me, but also because He loves me. I love God, that He died on the cross, was buried, and rose again on the third day. Yes, I do. <laughs> Amen! <laughs> Uh, and what is your good confession? Jesus is my life. Thank mm -hmm. you.